be chugga chugga chugga. Hmm. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a new product announcement video for these two 1.6 scale 50 caliber and 30 caliber machine gun cradle mount kits. The two cradles that we have here is the newly released E10014 cradle as well as the already released D38579 cradle. This unit has been on the ECA catalog now for a little while now. However, I haven't made a proper model announcement video for this unit, so I'm just gonna go ahead and include it with the newly released set that we have here. In addition to the cradles themselves, we'll also be briefly touching upon the pedestal mounts. This one here has the M31 pedestal, while this one here has the M25. All of the items that I just mentioned are listed on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog and can be found via the link listed below. All four of these sets are not included with each other and are sold separately. The construction materials also differ between each of these units. Currently, the pedestal bases are made out of cast resin, while the cradle mounts themselves are crafted in 3D printed materials. However, between the two sets, they are made out of different materials, and we will be going over all that info in this video. However, one thing that is not included with any of the sets, nor is it something that's listed on the ECA catalog, are the main armament themselves, which in this case, we have a Browning M2HB 50 caliber machine gun, and adjacent to it, we have here a Browning M1918A2 BAR. The mount here on the left-hand side is specifically designed for the Dragon M2HB, as well as the Dragon M1919A4. The mount on the opposite side can use basically any of the 1.6 scale 50 caliber and 30 caliber models that are on the market. In addition to the Dragon M2, there's another M2 on the market that is currently readily available on eBay. That unit is basically a copy of the Dragon tooling, so that model will be able to be mounted to this unit as well. The 21st Century Toys option may possibly be able to be secured to this cradle. However, I haven't tested this yet, so I do not have any guarantees if the unit will be able to just drop directly in or possibly need some minor adjustments in order to match the mounting holes that are present on this set. Even though the pieces are designed for the Dragon counterpart, some small minor hand fitting may still be required by the builder in order to get the pieces to fit into their appropriate locations in the position that you see it here. Although these two models here are in their vehicle mounted configuration, these two will just be kept in the condition that we see here and used primarily for display purposes. Of course, these two models are going to be going into my own personal collection and are not for sale and or purchase. However, if anyone is interested in having me work on models like the two you see here, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For pricing and availability information, that information will be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. So with all that out of the way, obviously we have a lot of information to discuss in this video and hopefully at the end you might be able to learn a few new things about the pedestal mounts as well as also the cradle mounts themselves. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around these two models.
Although the 3D printed cradles are a new addition and are something that were recently assembled and painted, the remainder of the components on both of these units here have been floating around the shop now for, in some cases, over a decade. This would include both the pedestals as well as also the models of the weapons themselves. Like I stated previously, both of the pedestals are made out of cast resin, and the M31 found on this example over here is actually one of the oldest items that have still been in constant production found on the ECA catalog. The original pedestal itself was tooled up back in 2005, and basically I was using this same mold ever since then. The molds actually hold up pretty well. The piece does show its age in one or two areas, but for the time being, the cast resin one is going to stay in production until I eventually phase it out with a 3D printed counterpart, which admittedly is something that I am working on. The unit that we have here was one that I casted about 10 or so years ago, actually probably longer than that, judging by the color of the resin, and this piece was originally casted for an order. However, because of a few deficiencies in some of the cast areas, it was not suitable for sale, so it just wound up languishing away in my spare bin. Even though the piece was not suitable for sale in orders, I was still able to use it for myself, and I basically took the unit, cleaned it up, and assembled it to the condition that you see it here. The M31 kit that you see here is based on a real M31 that I had the opportunity to see in person and photograph at a real military vehicle show back in 2005. That unit was slightly different than the example that we have here in that it was missing the travel lock and the travel lock storage equipment that are present on this example. Because of that, the example that is currently listed on the ECA catalog does not have the travel lock components as well as it also doesn't contain the support legs that you see here. One reason why I didn't produce the legs at that time was because of the thicknesses required to properly render these pieces, trying to have them in cast resin was a bit problematic. So rather than going with that route, I decided that it would be best to have the builder fabricate these pieces on their own end, where not only can they get the appropriate thicknesses of these pieces, but they can also fine tune them to the appropriate lengths required for their vehicle in question. The legs themselves are fabricated out of a quarter of an inch plastruct angle and basically glue two of them together and then you just polish away the seam with some red putty. Once the red putty is blended in, you will have the legs at the appropriate dimensions that you see on this example. As for the travel lock, all of these components here are scratch built out of sheet styrene. Eighth of an inch styrene plate was used to create the majority of the structure components, while styrene tubing was used to create the travel lock itself. The travel lock is fully functional, and when I pull this pin out, the unit will hinge down into its stowed section. With the travel lock pin yanked out of the cradle, you can see that the unit pivots downward and would then stow into the little recess that we have right here. Of course, all of these details and features are going to be found on the 3D printed counterpart when that eventually makes it to the market. As for the M25, this one here was developed within the last five or so years, and because of that, the need to replace this with a new 3D printed counterpart is just not necessary at this time. The molds are still fresh and output really good quality pieces. Unlike the M31, however, this one is really more or less a single piece casting, where the fins, the base, as well as even the weld beads are integrally casted into the component, so there's really no assembly required with the exception of installing the little vice type knob that we have here on the top. Just like with the M31, the vice knob is pre-assembled and basically just drops directly into this location during construction. One other subtle detail about the M25 set from ECA is that the top socket portion here does have some cast texturing present on this location. This is integrally molded into the component and is found on all the castings. Moving on up takes us to the star of the show, which is the E10014 14 cradle. This unit here was something that I always wanted to tool up in 1-6 scale because it's something that I always had an interest in since I first saw one many, many years ago. 
For the longest time, the only real option out there for a 1-6 scale cradle mount was the M23. Now, the M23 is an excellent mount and is one that is generally used more often than not on US armor. However, that wasn't the only gun mount that was designed and used on US armor during World War II. The E10014 cradle was used on not just tanks, but it was also found on other soft skin vehicles like Jeeps, trucks, half tracks, and so on and so forth. Aside from the M23, another cradle mount that has been on the market for a number of years now is a East Coast Armory cast resin item, which is this unit that we have here, and that would be the D69A20 cradle mount. This cradle mount is an early war type unit and was specifically tooled up in 2011 when I was working on my 1-6 scale early war M4A4 Sherman tank. I go over this unit in more depth in that video series and I even brush upon it again in the update video that I had for that model that I posted a little while ago. But basically what's unique about this system is that it has this retracting capability where if you hit this latch, the entire yoke can pivot downward into the commander's cupola, which in turn gives the commander a higher angle for his machine gun, which of course is used for shooting down airplanes. Like I said before, this unit is still in production and is found on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. Both the M23 and this unit here are exclusively designed for use with the Browning M250 caliber machine gun. And this one's the interesting example with the early pattern of slotted barrel shroud and also the shorter barrel. But more information on that is discussed in that video. As for this mount here, this mount was unique because it was designed for mounting either the Browning M2 and AN M2, but most importantly, this particular mount can also secure on the little brother, which is the Browning M1919 A4 machine gun. This is possible because of the overall dimensions of the two receivers. Both the M2 and the 1919 have receivers that are basically the same in width. But the difference, of course, lies in the length. Since both weapons were designed for tripod use, there is a rear T&E mount that's found right here on the back. When the unit is secured to the tripod, the T&E plugs into this section, and this allows the gunner to adjust accordingly. For vehicle mounting, that T&E mount is used for the rear lock pin, and with the one in the front, this secures the unit in place and prevents it from moving around. Of course, the T&E mount is also found on the 1919. However, because of the shorter receiver, the location is different. And this is why you cannot secure the 1919 to the standard M23 or the other unit that I just mentioned. So in order to have the capabilities to mount either of those guns to a single cradle, you have to have the provisions present for mounting both the M2 and the 1919. And this is where the E10014 cradle comes in handy. With the cradle itself, the real unit would be entirely comprising of cast components for both the yoke as well as the cradle itself. One unique feature that the E10 mount has is with its geometry. In order to counterbalance the weight of the gun, the M23 cradle has this large coiled spring that's located on the opposite side here of the cradle. The E10 went with a different route. Rather than going with a spring, they used some clever geometry to achieve basically a counterweight effect. And that can be seen if I pivot the unit upward. With the unit pivot upward, you can see that the piece has this descending section that we have right here. This serves two functions. First, this acts as the travel lock pin location, and you can actually secure everything in place that I'll touch upon in a moment. But the second thing that it does is that it adds extra mass to this very front portion that we have here. Because of that, the gun will want to stay in the downward position, as you can see right here from me trying to let go of it. One thing about the M2 is that it is very front heavy normally, but if you try to elevate it, it will actually stay locked in this position because of the mass of the rear portion of the receiver. And this may be tricky when trying to balance it out. But with this extra mass here on the front, it counterbalances the unit and it drops it down to the position that you see here. Another interesting feature involves this second set of notches that we have here. This too is meant for a travel lock position and basically it would secure it in the upward roll that I just showed. Another thing that I found unique about this system is that it has not one but two methods 
for a travel lock type setup. And this depends on exactly where the unit is mounted. If the unit is mounted on a soft skin type system that we have here, the travel lock is built into the pedestal and that locks into this little appendage that we have here on the rear. The piece simply hinges upward and then this chain retain pin goes ahead and secures everything in place. What's also unique about the E10 mount is that this little spacer over here is used for two things. It's used as a travel lock mount, but it's also used to secure on the Browning M1919. The way this is done is that you would actually undo these bolts here and this piece can pivot inward. And when it hinges around, this then allows you to go ahead and put the pin in place in order to secure the 1919 in this location. Unfortunately, I didn't get this on video. However, I did take several photographs of my Dragon M1919 during the construction of this unit. And you can see it popping up on the screen now. In addition to securing the 1919 in place, it too can still be used to lock into the travel lock that's found on the pedestal mount that I just showed. Well, outside of the one in the rear, if you are securing this unit on a vehicle like an M3 half track or a tank of one flavor or another, the built-in travel lock may not be present specifically you know, on a vehicle like a Sherman. So in that type of a role, that's when you would use the other travel lock that we have right here. To use this one, basically you would line up the holes and it would secure to this little hole that we have right here on the bottom. And with the way things line up, you simply just insert the pin in place. And once it's mounted, the cradle is locked up and it's not gonna move anywhere. If you want to go ahead and free the unit up, you simply just go in here, you yank this pin out, and now you have free motion to use the weapon. Also on the pins themselves, you can see I went ahead and painstakingly bent the little handles that are found on all of these pins. And when it comes to these cradles, there's also a litany of different type of pins and pin handles that are found. And there's lots of other documentation out there that shows different variations. For this particular example, I went with the setup that we have here. All of the components, by the way, that I just mentioned are supplied with the 3D printed ECA piece. And here you can see a picture of what the set looks like prior to any sort of assembly. The piece comes in really three components. So you have the yolk, the cradle, as well as a runner that houses the ammunition can holder, as well as the other bits of equipment used to get the piece fully assembled, like the pivot pins, the spacer, and the other belt holders, or the belt aligner system that's found on the tray itself. The set also comes with these plastic rods for use for the pins, as well as the wire and chain that are used to hinge, or I should say, have everything secured in place. Although the opposite side has all of the pins and other systems that I mentioned, the left-hand side of the cradle is equally as important, if not more, because this holds the ammunition can. The ammunition can you see here is the metal unit from DID, and for a long period of time, these were available on the aftermarket scene. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but I've had this can floating around the shop now since basically 2006. This unit, although you see the DID can being mounted, it is still able to mount many of the other 1.6 scale 50 caliber ammo cans that are on the market from any other companies from 21st Century Toys to Dragon to any sort of aftermarket kit out there. This can holder should be able to fit that unit. However, what's really cool about this system, and this is true on all of the American cradles, is that the tray holder is fully removable. On the real unit, you would hit this little latch over here, and when this latch is moved, this loosens up the unit, and the entire tray mount can slide directly off. With the tray off, you get to see the tray holder in place, and again, all of this detailing is included with the 3D printed set. With the tray holder removed, you get to see the other details that are found on not just the inside portion, but also the underside. And you'll see that there are these four square notches that are cut in place. There's a reason for that, and that'll be discussed as soon as I can remove the ammo can itself. With the ammo can removed, you can see exactly 
what the inside looks like. Now note on this section over here of those punch outs, you can see a bit of material that's curled up in these four locations. Why this is the case? Well, quite simply put, this ammo can tray here is a multi-caliber system and it can hold not just the 50 caliber ammo can that I just showcased, but it also can secure on the 30 caliber ammo can for the 1919. Because of this, you don't even need to necessarily change the ammo can tray in order to convert the system for a 30 caliber system. To illustrate how the 30 caliber can would fit in place, here I have a Dragon M1919 30 caliber ammo can, and it basically just locks into the recesses that I just mentioned. Now, it appears that it's not mounting the Dragon can on very well. However, I could go ahead and change this out for the production units. Keep in mind, this is a pre-production sample, so the production units are going to be a bit more refined compared to this unit over here. But you get the basic idea. This also explains, by the way, why the little belt tension arm is off center on the tray. This is because with this location here, it can hold onto the belt on both the 30 caliber ammo can, if the can, if the lid of course was open, as well as the 50 caliber ammo can, if mounted in place. The purpose of this system is that this acts as a tensioner and it puts tension onto the ammo belt, preventing it from flopping around, which can possibly cause malfunctions. This piece is comprised of three components where we have this long arm, the top portion of the arm where there's this nice little convenient handle, and then the bottom portion is this articulating pad. All of these components are supplied with a 3D printed set and are designed to be fully functional. Also included are the metal pins which secure everything together and also the little wire that's supplied in order for the builder to fabricate the little spring details that you see here. The springs are formed by the builder but there's something that can relatively be done easily by just wrapping the supplied wire around a small little nail and then after you get the bends figured out the unit goes together pretty easily. And on that note that's one aspect that makes the American cradle system so adaptable because there are so many options available that can fit onto this universal ammo can mounting system where there's a plethora of different type of ammo can trays to even the tombstone pattern of 200 round 50 caliber ammo can that just slides directly into this location here with no tray being necessary which may or may not be something I might be tooling up in the near future because I already have the universal tray mount to figure it out and tooling up the tombstone shouldn't be too difficult. On the topic of the tray, there's something else I wanna mention and that involves the ammo can itself. You see, this type of tray here is specifically designed for the World War II 50 caliber ammo can. And that is this pattern that we have here. The differences being with the design of the can as well as also how the lid opens up. The World War II ammo cans open up with this type of system where if you open up this latch, the lid opens outward. This would be changed in the post-war years where the can would open up from the side and there were a few reasons for that. One interesting thing on the World War II ammo cans, if you look on the top, you will see embossed into the lid a little pictogram of ammunition. And this is there specifically for a reason because this would be the orientation that the belt would be in inside the can. Obviously when the thing's buttoned up, you can't see it, but it's specifically done this way so you don't flip it around accidentally when you're putting it inside of the ammo tray. It's also because of this clasp over here, which is why the ammo can tray has this unique little angular cut to it. If I take the ammo can, put it into the tray, you'll see that that cutout perfectly clears that little clasp that we have on the can. I open up the can, there we go, and I open the unit up, the piece hinges forward and then the, the belt tensioner just drops directly into place the way we see it here. And this was actually one of the reasons why the ammo cans were redesigned. If you look at the top, you can see that the ammunition is completely exposed to the elements. Well, when the ammo cans were redesigned in the 1950s and 60s, they have that design where the ammo can lid actually acts as a dust cover and that the clasp system goes over the ammo belt and acts as the tensioner, as well as also as a secondary guard. This is why late 
or I should say post-World War II ammo cans had that unique shape to them in order for them to prop open slightly without overextending, opening up the ammunition to the elements. However, the designers were smart enough to incorporate a quick disconnect feature on the lid. So if you do have one of these older systems, you simply just slide the lid off the hinge and then you have an open ammo can for the tensioner on this older powder unit to still be utilized. One last thing I want to mention on the M2 involves the front mounted flash suppressor. The conical flash suppressor was a component that I used to offer on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog for a number of years. This piece here was developed back in 2011. In fact, that is actually when I built the Model M2 here in question. It was specifically built in order to test one of these components out on a actual 1.6 scale M2 just to make sure everything fits. The unit is designed specifically for the Dragon pattern of M2HB, which in my opinion is probably the best rendition out there in 1.6 scale. As for the component, it's comprised of two resin castings. You have the front section and the rear flange, and then the securing fasteners here are made from small metal wire that you assemble together to the unit and the setup that are present here. The reason why this component here is no longer listed on the ECA catalog was because this within the last year or two was retired and in place I have a HD 3D printed component which gives you the exact same details if not more accurate compared to my old school resin counterpart. That unit is found on the ECA catalog and again is designed for use on the Dragon pattern of M2HB. With the E10 mount out of the way this leads us to the D3 A579 mount. This mount is very similar to the E10 in that it is a multi-weapon mount and is not just used for the M2HB. Unlike the E10 cradle, which is designed for use on either the M1919 or the M2, the D mount over here is a little bit more flexible in that you can not only secure on those other two weapons that I just mentioned, but you can do what I've done here and mount on the Browning M1918A2 BAR. Although it may sound a little weird to have a magazine-fed automatic rifle mounted in a what is normally a machine gun mount, but this was something that the D-mount was capable of doing. Unfortunately, I didn't go ahead and get on video either the M2 or the 1919 being mounted to this system. However, you can see photographs of both of those models being mounted to the D-mount that we have here. The ECA D3 A579 mount is entirely comprised of HD 3D printed components. And unlike the E mount that I just mentioned, this one here consists of a single runner that supplies you with all of the printed parts to assemble the unit. This would include the yolk system as well as the handles. And one other bit of equipment that's supplied is the spacer. Because the unit can't fit all three of these weapons. The spacer is required so that you can use a thinner diameter pin to hinge everything together. When the other pin is not in use, it goes into this storage slot that we have right over here, which keeps it out of the way and again prevents it from snagging into things. Also supplied with the set is a thin piece of wire as well as chain in order to complete the setup that we have here. One other interesting fact I want to mention about the D-mount is that this is the basis of the post-World War II mounts that were developed in order to secure the M60 machine gun to a pinnel type system. But again, more information on that is to follow at another date at another time. As for the BAR model in question, this particular example is a 21st Century Toys M1918A2. This model was clunking around my 1-6 scale weapons tackle box now since 1999 and the piece was in pretty rough condition. The bipod legs were busted and the unit itself just was not holding up very well. The sling was this elastic material that was overstretched so this made it the perfect candidate for this type of a display piece. The model was cleaned up where the company's name was removed off of the buttstock here. The bipod legs were repaired, however they are non-functional, they're just in the retracted state that you see. And the entire piece was 
repainted in the configuration that you see here. Of course, being in 1918A2, the buttstock would be a black Bakelite type material, and so I went ahead and painted and weathered it to reflect that. I believe I also drilled out the front sight base as this was molded solid on the 21st Century Toys example, and it's just a simple way to squeeze a little bit more of extra detailing out on a basic system like you see here. To secure the BAR to the D-mount, that's utilizing the front takedown pin that we have here. You need to drill this out in order to use the ECA smaller diameter pin that I touched upon before. One thing that's interesting though on the real unit is that this takedown pin actually holds on the entire forearm and gas tube system that's present on this weapon. So if you need to remove the gun off of the mount for whatever reason in field, um, that, that's going to be a bit problematic. I presume you probably have somewhere in a pouch a spare takedown pin so you could, you know, connect it and use the gun in that format. But again, it's just a uh, interesting quirk that's found when you mount the BAR to this type of a setup. And well, that's about it. So hopefully if you made it to this point of the video, perhaps you learned something new about the Browning machine guns and how they mount and secure to the vehicles that we all know and love to build and display in our collections. This subject matter here is basically a genre in its own right, and it's just another small piece of the pie to think about when you're working on your model, regardless of the scale that it is rendered in. Even though these ones here are in 1.6 scale, there are several variants of these exact same components in these smaller scales that are out there on the commercial as well as also the aftermarket scene and it's something to keep in mind for any builder out there as a way to further enhance their model as opposed to using the standard tried and true units that are supplied with the kits in general. And although this subject matter is generally something that one would expect more frequently from the Forgotten Weapons channel as opposed to the ECA channel, this is a topic and subject matter that I personally always had a lot of interest in and found very fascinating, which is basically the reason why I went ahead and tooled up and designed the components that we see here. Although both of these models can be mounted to any number of vehicles of my choosing, for these two models here, that's not going to be the case. Like I stated earlier, both of these models are just going to be in my collection where they're going to be used as display pieces. And if the need be ever arises, I can easily take them out and use them for some kind of a pillbox or some kind of a emplacement type setup. However, until that scene or need ever arises, both of these models are just going to be adorning the shelf in my display case. And with that, that wraps up this new product announcement video for these two 1.6 scale US World War II machine gun cradle mounts. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being new product announcement videos like this one over here, or my usual content, which mostly consists of either small scale model showcase videos, or 1.6 scale project update videos when they get posted. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of these two particular units as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are frequently showcased on this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale parts as well as detailed components. Thanks again and I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Take care.